Terrific news from Israel. Three Israeli fathers were axed to death. Several others were wounded by two terrorists heeding a call from Hamas to murder and maim. The fathers leave behind 16 children. Israeli security forces are on a massive manhunt for the two Palestinians suspected of carrying out that brutal rampage. Many fear this attack, which is the seventh in an ongoing wave of terror, could lead Israel into another war with Hamas. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. The terror attack came just at the end of Israel's Independence Day, when Israelis were celebrating the birth of the nation 74 years ago. We're talking about several crime scenes uh, in the city of Elad. Uh, we have, uh, unfortunately, we have three dead people, three dead citizens, and several wounded that were uh, taken to hospital. It was the seventh in a wave of terror attacks in the last two months that have killed nearly 20 and wounded dozens. The three fathers murdered on Thursday were reportedly in their 30s and 40s and left behind 16 children. And as they have after other terror attacks, Palestinians celebrated in Gaza by passing out candy. Hamas praised Thursday's attack, where the two terrorists used an axe to murder and maim. Just days earlier, Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar encouraged Palestinians to attack Israelis and recommended what weapons to use. Whoever has a gun should prepare it, and whoever does not have a gun should prepare his cleaver, axe, or knife. He also issued a call to Palestinians in the West Bank to launch more attacks. Do not wait for a decision by anyone. The lone wolf operations have proven to be extremely successful. On Memorial Day just two days ago, Israelis stood in silence and remembered those who died in Israel's wars and terrorist strikes. Prime Minister Naftali Bennett used the opportunity to lament how Palestinians through the years have chosen death over life. If only our enemies had invested in building their future, a tenth of the energy they invest in harming us, their situation would have been completely different. But they choose the sanctification of death, which leaves them wallowed in poverty, misery, and a constant sense of victimhood. He added a common thread runs through all the waves of terror Israel has suffered through the years. The characteristics are different, but the motivation remains the same, to turn our lives here in our homeland into hell. The concern for many here is that this wave of terrorism will lead to another war between Hamas and Israel, just like it did one year ago. Gordon? Well, Chris, I've got to ask, uh, how likely is the war with Hamas? Well, Gordon, actually, it's a realistic possibility. The circumstances now in uh, May of 2022 are very similar to what it was 20 and 21. Uh, that year, the flashpoint was a place called Sheikh Jarrah. I'm sure you remember that in the Temple Mount. Here we are in May of 2022. The Temple Mount riots, these terror attacks, they're flashpoints. Hamas leader Sinwar, the Yassar and I report, he's warning if Israel of a religious war. And the speech that he gave several days ago, it was full of incitement, for example, Example, he warned about terror attacks in Jewish synagogues around the world. Because of that now, Israeli officials have warned Sinwar of possible retaliation following all these series of terror attacks. And they consider him a terror instigator, say they'll respond accordingly, and they're going to hold him responsible for urging these Palestinians, Arab Israelis, to commit these terror attacks, which means Israel feels like it has freedom of action in the Gaza Strip. So. Uh, Gordon, it's possible this situation could ramp up into another war, just like last year. Well, it's quite clear it's incitement, and it's incitement to murder people. Uh, when is the world going to deal with the underlying ideology here? It seems like uh, we're, we're just trying to placate the Palestinians, uh, and this has been going on now for decades. Uh, when, are, when are we clearly going to address this ideology and say this is absolute evil? Well, that's a great question, uh, uh, Gordon, and it remains to be seen. You know, we have talked about this. We've reported on this on CBN News for years, actually. I, I can go back to 2000 and remember some of the reports about incitement. I think sometimes the Western powers just don't hold the Palestinian Authority, which also incites 
or Hamas uh, of what they say. And uh, you can see just a direct parallel between what Sinwa said the other day about using axes and knives. And here we are just last night when an axe was used to murder and maim these, uh, these three fathers and, and then wound many more. Uh, but I think that the world does need to w wake up to know what is being said. It's being said in Arabic, but they need to understand the translation into English. Well, what does this do for the fragile coalition for Israel's government? How, how, what, how do you see this playing out in their elections? Well, it puts the coalition in uh, in very fragile condition right now. It's lasted now about 11 months. Some people don't leave, will last a month, two, three months. They go back into the Knesset uh, just in, in about a week, and then they're going to have actually a vote for a no confidence vote. So it doesn't seem like it's going to last much longer. One of the one of the really key uh, moments right now. Gordon, is the fact that Mansour Abbas, he's the head of an Islamist party. He's under enormous pressure to leave the coalition. In fact, Sinwa called Abbas out by name and blamed him for providing a security net for Israel's government because his four seats are critical to have a, keep the coalition together. He blames him for standing with the government that's desecrated the Al-Aqsa Mosque. So Sinwa says it's a crime they can't forgive. So if Abbas leaves the coalition with his one, two, or four seats in total that he has, uh, it's really going to lead to a collapse of the government, and then we may be leading to new elections here in Israel. Well, Chris, thanks for the insights. Thanks for the report from Jerusalem. And let me remind everyone, this is an uh, ideology, and it goes back a long time. This isn't something new. The radicalization happened in the 1950s. Before that, they really didn't even identify as Palestinians. It was the PLO being created in Egypt that actually started that movement, and that was in the 1950s. Uh, and it was started with someone who wasn't even from Palestine, which is, uh, you know, you, you get into the, the history here and, and the weaving of lies back and forth over time that it's become generational and become an identity and a truth for the people living there now. We have to come against these ideas. The idea to drive Israel into the sea is a lie. Israel has every right under international law to exist. The idea that you somehow get merit in heaven by killing Jews is an absolute lie. These, these things have to be confronted by the entire world and say, no, uh, you've, been, you've been sold something for generations. And I'll echo what the Prime Minister of Israel just said. It has trapped you in uh, poverty and misery. It is your own fault you're there. It has nothing to do with Israel. If you had wanted another state, you could have had one in 1948. You could have had one in 1967. You could have had one in 1973. Let me go through all the Oslo Accords, all of it. You could have had one. And here's the irony of ironies. Israel would have given you Jerusalem. Uh, but because of the hardness of your heart, you refused it. In that, you have to recognize, look in the mirror, blame yourself for where you are. In other news, the government has now put strict limitations on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because of serious health risks. John Jessup has that story from Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. Regulators took that action because of the ongoing possibility of rare but serious blood clots. The Food and Drug Administration said the shot should only be given to adults who can't get any other vaccine or specifically request the one from Johnson & Johnson. The FDA's vaccine chief said the agency decided to make the restriction after taking another look at the data on the risks of blood clots and concluding they're limited to the J&J &J vaccine. Now, the problem occurs in the first two weeks after vaccination, so if you got a J&J &J shot a while ago and haven't had any problems with blood clots, experts say you can rest easy. Some reassuring news there. Well, turning now to the war in Ukraine, where more civilians were rescued today from the tunnels under that besieged steel plant in Mariupol. Ukrainian resistance fighters are refusing to surrender as Russian forces try to complete their takeover of the city. That fight is happening amid new reports about the intelligence the United States is sharing with Ukraine in their war against the Russian invasion. 
Brody Carter brings us that story. In the bunkers of Mariupol, under the Azovstal steel plant, Ukrainian defenders are taking what may be their last stand against Russian troops. Over 200 civilians, including children, are trapped here. Heavy, bloody battles have made escape nearly impossible. Fresh attempts to rescue those trapped resumed this morning. If the Kremlin completes its capture of the strategic port city, it would be Russia's biggest success so far in the war. The violence that's being visited on Mariupol uh, and the destruction that's being caused there uh, as a continued uh, bombardment by, by, by Russian airstrikes uh, in, in Mariupol. Vladimir Putin is pushing for a victory to showcase on Monday Russia's Victory Day, a pageantry parade which celebrates the Soviets' triumph over Nazi Germany. Despite the war, volunteers in Mariupol cleaned up the streets so its citizens can mark the holiday as well. Back here at home, the Pentagon is responding to a New York Times report saying the U.S. is providing intelligence to Ukraine, including Russian troop movements in strategic locations, which has led to the death of a dozen Russian generals. We do not provide intelligence on the location of senior military leaders on the battlefield or participate in the targeting decisions of the Ukrainian military. Meanwhile, similar reports have surfaced that the U.S. also shared intelligence about the location of the Russian missile cruiser warship, the Moskva, which helped Ukraine successfully target and sink that ship in the Black Sea, a major failure for the Russian military. The U.S. says Ukraine made the decision to sink that ship. The Pentagon saying America supplies Kyiv's forces with military intelligence solely to help Ukrainians defend their country. As the fighting continues, civilians are paying a heavy price for Putin's war. More than 12 million Ukrainians have fled their homes. Six and a half million are still somewhere in Ukraine, while 5.7 million have left for neighboring countries, with more than 3 million going to Poland. Brody Carter, CBN News. Thank you, Brody. Gordon, more and more, it's harder to see the end in sight of this war. Now, there's no end in sight, but I, I really want to point out how the New York Times it seems to continue to get it wrong. Uh, back just a few years ago, they were claiming that um, President Trump uh, had some kind of deal and knew about Putin putting out bounties on U.S. soldiers in Afghanistan. Uh, that got a lot of play, a lot of reaction. It was uh, time for the election, all of that. And then after the election, it comes out, that's not true and, and never was true. And they didn't properly fact check their story. Here, during the middle of the war, they're claiming U.S. intelligence helped Ukrainians target Russian generals. Now, that is an incitement for this war to spread and for Russia to now retaliate against U.S. interests in Europe. Uh, th you, this is a story you absolutely have to get right. And for the Pentagon to come out and say it's dead wrong, it never happened, we aren't assisting Ukraine in targeting at all, uh, makes me question the New York Times. What is their editorial policy, and are they going to come out with some kind of apology? Two years ago, his position didn't exist, probably wasn't even thought possible. Israel's first ambassador to Bahrain is a direct result of the Abraham Accords. Chris Mitchell brings us the CBN News exclusive interview with the, the ambassador about historic changes happening in the Middle East. Few people have witnessed the dramatic transformation in the Middle East Gulf states, like Eitan Na'e, Israel's first ambassador to Bahrain. I saw two Israeli embassies open in the Gulf one in the UAE, one in Bahrain, a consulate general that was opened uh, in Dubai, dozens of, uh, of agreements uh, that were signed. From the birth of the Abraham Accords on the White House lawn, Ambassador Na'e has been a key player in the agreements. There is significant, in fact, historical change to the course of events in the Middle East. They are an effort uh, to take a road that has not been taken before, establish a relationship between Israel and Arab countries, and not just that, it's proving to the rest of the Arab countries, to the rest of the world, and to the rest of the people in this region that it is possible. But about 100 miles from Manama, the capital here in Bahrain, and across the Gulf, lies Iran and its regime that represents an existential threat, not only to Israel, but to this tiny Gulf country. Ambassador NIA says the Gulf countries see the Iranian nuclear deal just like Israel does. We hear from them exactly what we say. I think that the threat 
and the threat perception, the threat levels are pretty identical uh, by those who live in this region, by those who experience the kind of behavior that Iran got uh, infamous for. And the threat, the concern is, is real. Uh, we all know that the mother of all problems in the Middle East is, is Iran. Uh, all we have to do is to watch the news. CBN News met with the ambassador during a visit of a delegation of evangelical Christian leaders to Bahrain and the UAE, led by Joel Rosenberg. During our time in Manama, violence continued to rock Jerusalem's Temple Mount. Ambassador Nae explains the rioting is nothing new. In the 30s, in the, amid a wave of uh, Jewish immigration to, uh, to then mandatory Palestine, running away from Hitler, uh, just prior to the Second World War, and what the Palestinian uh, leader then, uh, Haj Amin al-Husseini, saw as Arab indifference, he came up with the idea of uh, how to attract attention, and Al-Aqsa was the answer. Uh, the Jews are threatening Al-Aqsa. He disseminated this uh, fake news, they didn't call it then fake news, but lie, and uh, it caught fire, and uh, it is still uh, catching fire. He says the rocks being thrown are not just at Israeli police, and Jewish worshippers at the Western Wall. But they're really thrown at the Abraham Accords. I asked our viewers, uh, your viewers, to really zoom out from just this event and say, look, they're doing it for the second year since uh, the Abraham Accords were signed in order to derail the Abraham Accords. Ambassador Nia points to the media's impact in the region. The peace process cannot advance without the public opinion. And the public opinion here in the region is being influenced by other media outlets that disseminate lies, fake news. And the role of the media is to really show the truth uncut, to show the truth, to give the full picture, and to explain to people uh, what we're trying to do here. And that is an immensely important. Nia also says they welcome prayers from Christians around the world. Yes, we need those prayers. We need this help. Uh, we need those people who can to come and visit, to see in their own eyes that a new reality is being born. And those among the viewers who have business in the Middle East, come and do business uh, with Israel, uh, with Bahrain, with the UAE, uh, bring people together and still pray for the, uh, for the peace of, of Jerusalem and the region. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Manama, Bahrain. That's a story you're likely not going to see anywhere else, but it's a story of encouragement that, yes, indeed, Israel can have peace with her neighbors. You don't have to have peace first with the Palestinians or with Hamas, a terrorist group. You don't have to have peace with them. You don't have to have peace first with Iran. You can structure agreements and come to agreement with people of goodwill, and let's have more of that, and let's have peace spread throughout the region. In that, you're going to isolate the ideologues, the radicals, the ones who want to wipe Israel off the map, and you're going to show the entire world what can happen when a region comes to peace. You can, un, you can tap into the incredible human capital there, the ingenuity, the inventiveness, and release a great new wave of prosperity, and that would be good for everybody. Let's encourage it. Let's pray for peace in the Middle East and especially for the peace of Jerusalem. From town to town, rodeo cowboys are on the road for more than 200 days a year. It's a tough way of life, and professional bareback rider Anthony Thomas has been doing it for 12 years. Sports reporter Tom Buring talked with the veteran and his new rookie about what it takes to compete on the rodeo circuit. Bareback riding is the ultimate test of man versus beast. You're putting yourself in an extremely labor-intensive, dangerous situation at all times, a blur of aggression and madness. The same rodeo bareback riders who fight for their seats must also fight for their success. They're world-class competitors at the mercy of their handheld grips. You're going to go into this fight and you're going to win. And if not, you could end up badly hurt or killed. You have to have complete control in a completely uncontrollable situation. Anthony Thomas is from Australia, but now lives in Texas. The professional rodeo veteran has learned to maneuver the rugged uncertainty of both the ride and the life that comes with it. Does that transfer over to the culture and lifestyle of rodeo? Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of camaraderie. We travel together and we compete against each other. You go from town to town and rodeo to rodeo, and you can just live a reckless lifestyle. We're on the road for over 200 days out of the year, and so they, they have to be like your family. 
it's great for me to be able to be a mentor for them, not just in the sport entirely, but in their spiritual life and their Christian walk as well. Today's a beautiful day for a cowboy baptism. Got a young bareback rider who's made the best choice he'll ever make. Mark Foster has pastored and mentored rodeo cowboys for decades. Anthony was one of them, who now brings other competitive riders alongside his mentoring. What is it about the cowboy life that requires mentoring to navigate things? Rodeo life is not an easy life. There's a lot of challenges, there's a lot of temptations there. So it's really good for them to have some accountability. And Anthony wants accountability. Anthony began to learn how, as a real tough guy, to surrender to Jesus. And he's a great mentor to young cowboys. Do you find yourself advising the way that you wish you could have been advised years ago? Yeah, absolutely. I came to America and I didn't even know how this whole game of rodeo worked. And so in this way of life, everybody wants to muscle it out and be so strong and be tough and take care of things themselves and hold on to the one thing that they think that they can have control of. And really, you don't get tough until you surrender those things. You have to surrender control every day to God. The definition of faith says to trust Him. Waylon Bourgeois is new to the circuit and is this year's front runner as Rodeo Bareback Rookie of the Year. What's the best advice Anthony has given you in living out your faith? There's a bunch of advice that he's given me. If I'd have to pick one right now, it would be just be a better person than you were the day before. That really stood out to me. You take steps you never knew you could do. It drives me every time I pull up to the radio. How does the companionship and even the accountability with him help you? It's always good to have an older guy in the rig and a younger guy in the rig because the younger guy brings the want and he definitely has fire, you know. He, he wants it. Experiences, you know, he's been there, done that. He's, he's been riding buck horses for 12 years now and I'm definitely grateful to guide me and lead me in the right direction. You trust your training from the muscle memory that you have that you taught yourself during the week on the spur board and the bucket machine. And so, I mean, if you don't work at it and prepare for it during the week, of course you're gonna overthink it and be like, hey, am I ready for it? What are the challenges in making choices that you believe in, in the industry that you're in? Yeah, rodeo definitely has its bad and good, but life does too, you know. You can turn the other cheek and walk away from bad choices, or you can stay close to God and, and make the right choices. The very athlete that you're mentoring is your competitor. Why empower him? It's my job as a Christian to add value to people's lives and be salt and light to the world. The more I can pour into his life and try to steer him away from the big mistakes that I made early in my career and in my life, the better off I'm going to be, because the better he's doing, the better I'm going to be doing. And if he's a successor from something he learned from me or through me, then that's far greater success than winning a world title. Waylon and I are representatives of Christ, so the number one goal in life is to be the hands and feet of Jesus. You're fearless competitors. You have to be. What does surrender mean to you? You surrender to a bug and horse and you're hitting the dirt real fast, but it's okay to surrender to God because He's going to achieve more things than you ever thought you could achieve. You don't want to show weakness, but God is our Lord and Savior, and it's okay to show weakness to Him. In our weakness, He is made strong. There's so many highs and lows. You might go a whole two or three months without ever winning a check. You might be injured. You don't draw a horse that's good enough that you can win on. And no matter what happens, I can have the strongest warrior attitude because I have a God that created the whole world that's on my side. I surrender and die to self every day and put Jesus first in my life. No matter what happens, I'll always end up on top and I'll always be provided for. How do you encourage people that have the opportunity to invest into somebody else's life? You have a platform right where you are. God's placed you in a perfect position right where you are. You don't have to achieve whatever it is you think in your head that you have to become before you can minister to somebody, talk to somebody about Jesus. And there's somebody watching, there's somebody around you, somebody in your circle of life that you can be the difference for. Those are incredible words of wisdom and an incredible way to say, I'm going to live my life this way. Uh, I learned a long time ago to disciple somebody else, all you have to do is stay a chapter ahead. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to be the perfect Christian. You just have to be real. And in that reality, say, here's what God has shown me. This is what he's done in my life. He can do the same thing for you if you would just let him. 
let the story inspire you. Um, part way through that story, my back started hurting just watching what they were doing. I was like, wow, how can you ever do that? But then you hear the words of wisdom, the mentorship, the discipleship happening, and then the willingness to say, if the person I'm discipling is succeeding, then I'm winning. That's a great way to look at things. Forge generational links, the transmission of the gospel from one generation to another. It doesn't happen accidentally. It doesn't happen by osmosis. You have to be very intentional with it and disciple the next generation. Welcome to Washington for the CBN News Break. The Satanic Temple is requesting to fly a flag over Boston City Hall after the Supreme Court ruled the city could not prevent a Christian flag from being flown in front of the building. The group wants to raise a flag to mark Satanic Appreciation Week in late July. The organization hasn't decided which of its official flags it will ask the city to fly, but one likely option is based on the American flag, with black and white stripes and an emblem of a pentagram and goat skull, where the 50 stars would be. The Satanic Temple doesn't believe in Satan. Instead, it describes itself as a non-theistic religious uh, organization that advocates for secularism. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing is bringing essential medical help to those in need around the world. Angie in Peru was pregnant, and her ultrasound showed the baby was okay, but that was before her second one, which she and her husband couldn't afford. Then Operation Blessings donors sent an ultrasound brigade to Angie's local health center, offering free ultrasound services, allowing Angie to get her second one. It turned out to be potentially life-saving for both Angie and her unborn baby, a doctor was concerned about the images he saw, and he recommended a specialized imaging test. It turned out Angie's baby didn't have enough amniotic fluid and was small, and she was admitted to the hospital because of how dangerous the situation could be. The next day, she safely gave birth, though, to a beautiful little daughter, and Angie's husband said, thanks to you all, my daughter is here with me and alive. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. When Eric Weir pitched his idea to franchise exclusively all the top golf locations worldwide, the owners laughed at him. But he did not take no for an answer, and that same tenacity has turned Eric into a phenomenal success. Eric Weir is the head of WCM Global Wealth, a financial advisory firm serving clients at the top of entertainment, sports, and wealth circles. He starts with this conviction. When you chase success for success's sake, wealth for wealth's sake, everything else in your life comes unhinged. In his debut book, Who's Eating Your Pie? Eric shares how to overcome obstacles and find true success by keeping the right priorities. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Eric Weir. Eric, it's wonderful to have you with us today. Well, thanks for having me on today. You experienced trauma at the age of five. Tell us a little bit about what happened and how it affected you. So my mom uh, and, and my brother and I were in an automobile and we're going through the intersection and we're T-boned at a really high rate of speed and we spun around and uh, I was terrified. I was, I was afraid that the car would catch on fire. And both the police who arrived at the scene shortly after and my mother said to stay in the car and respect and authority and you know, being five years old and not, not wanting to be run over by a car, I stayed in. But in that, I was just terrified. And my parents said notice until I was home later that evening. And my, my uh, speaking patterns had changed. And they, they found out when I said, please p -p 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 pass the potatoes. So it changed my life. And that, and that, that became a, a point in life where I had a, a massive stutter to deal with from that point forward. You share in the book um, so honestly how that stuttering impacted your life for decades, really. And yet, you didn't let it hold you back from becoming successful. Eventually, it dissipated. What happened? Around age 38, I, I became grateful. And I, I, I would put myself in situations in business or sales or at church and greeting people. And I began to make people uncomfortable. They shake your hand and, and you're like, hi, my name's uh, you're Weir. And for some reason, E's and W's are hard to say when you stutter. And that's Eric Weir. Uh, and one day I just said, you know, God, thank you for making me who I am and giving me the, the skills and limitations and things that I have. Please let me learn from them and grow um, and, and represent you well. And over the next 
two or three years. It wasn't like the next day, but over the next two or three years, the, the stutter just, just went away. Wow. Yeah, a lot. As I read your book, I was just thinking how a lot of people would have gotten stuck with the challenge that that presented to you. Will you share with us how people sometimes sabotage their own success and then what you suggest they can do to stop that? Yeah, so the, so the, the, the biggest thing to think about is, is people, um, the book is called, you know, Who's Eating Your Pie? And the, the, the premise is there are things that hold us back, there are things that ta tax us, there are things that hurt us. And oftentimes, the, the things that hold us back the most are our own limiting thoughts. And what I try to encourage people to do is give yourself permission to dream, uh, give yourself permission to imagine a, a different outcome. And then in the book, we talk about how, how to take steps to attain that, to plan, to, to start with very small increments will change because we usually wildly overestimate what we can accomplish in a short period of time and equally underestimate what we can accomplish with just small change over a longer period of time. You in the book share a story of going to the top golf executives and and wanting, I mean, wanting to put in a bid to develop top golf locations, and they laughed you right out of there. They said, absolutely not. Some people would have said, you know, okay, that's a definitive no. I'm going to move on to the next opportunity I might have. You did right. not. You turned that no into a yes. Talk about how you did that. Yeah, so I went there. They're they're very smart and just, just brilliant people. And I asked them for worldwide exclusive financing rights, and they literally laughed at me. And I, you know, it was kind of funny. And then they asked me, "Well, how much money do you have available right now to develop?" And I said, "Now, none." Then they laughed again. The one guy goes, "I like that guy." Uh, and then I said, "Well, it's really better for you. You've heard of diamonds and rubies, and diamonds are more plentiful than rubies." Uh, but uh, rubies are more valuable because of the De Beers family who, who, who uh, for years has, has had a limited release. Um, and it's the same thing. So, so I was, I, what I was saying is if, if you had a, a point to go to worldwide, then, then that would be, then I would be able to negotiate very good deals for you. And ended up not, not getting the, the world. I got some locations in the U S and we're, we're doing some in Europe, but it ended up being a, a big win uh, from where we started from with zero to, to quite a few. You divide what you call the pie of life into five slices. What are they? It's faith, family, fitness, finances, and, and friends. And really, you, you, God is the center of the spoke. And what I tell people is to, to look at it. You, you have to have balance. It's so hard to get balance in life, and we're never ever perfectly in balance. But in the book, I teach you how to create wealth, but I also talk about evaluating, because if you create wealth and spend your energy there, typically what you ignore in life or uh, due to focusing on one thing too much, you, it consumes you later in life. So if I spend all my time getting wealth later in life, I'll attempt to use my wealth to restore my health or to hopefully restore my family. So be focused on all things, faith, your family, your fitness, your finances, and your friends. And imagine a, a, a wagon wheel and God's the center and you have spokes of, of varying length. So if you're a five for faith and a two for family and a three for fitness, you go away around, it's kind of a lumpy wheel. So I try to draw a wheel and to say, where am I at that time? And there are going to be times of imbalance, times we start a business, times we have a baby, times we, you know, just have change. So it's never going to be perfect, but have a way to evaluate periodically how you're doing. So you're not surprised in the end. Yeah. So many people currently are struggling financially, rising food and gas prices. What's your best nugget of advice for them? You know, it, it's, it's this too shall pass. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's an inflationary time. It's a time that, that's brought on by monetary policy of money in the financial system. Uh, be smart, be, be prudent. I believe it will, will pass, but uh, you know, just seek as best you can to, to, to make the decisions that are prudent today and also have an eye for the future. And if you can still try to save a little, a little bit on a periodic basis uh, for your future. I think everybody thinks if I just had this much money, I could solve these problems and life would be great and I would be happy. What are the biggest misconceptions that people have about building wealth? Most people desire wealth because they think it'll make them happy.
and they want to be rich because they want to make them happy. And happiness and wealth are not really related. So wealth is a wonderful tool. It's a very poor master. We've all heard that said before. But really what I try to point out is the five Fs, faith, family, fitness, finance, friends. There's never been anyone on their deathbed that says, shower me with $100 bills. They're like, where's my family? Where are my friends? I, I want people with me now. And that's really it. So it's, it's a di direction and a focusing life uh, with balance and thoughtfulness and not just a mindless pursuit of wealth or material possessions. Would you say that's the biggest mistake that people make, wrong focus? 100%, as I, as I tell my children were growing up, if, if you climb a ladder very, very quickly and you, you make great progress, but that ladder's on the wrong wall, have you really made progress? So the most important thing is to take time, even daily, and plan and evaluate and see how, how you're doing over the grand scheme of what you hope to accomplish in life. Well, the book is fascinating. I want to mention to our viewers, it's called Who's Eating Your Pie? It's available uh, anywhere books are sold, and it's filled with wisdom and sound advice. Thanks for being with us, Eric. Nice to visit with you. It's my pleasure, and thank you very much. Well, two cups of porridge, that's all a grandmother in Thailand and her grandson had to eat. Then COVID hit, and they had no food at all. But here is how you 700 Club members came to their rescue. Ever since her husband died, Grandma Dawn has been taking care of her grandson alone. My grandson and I have only each other. He is the apple of my eye, and I love him with all my heart. Grandma worked hard cleaning houses and as a caregiver for an elderly neighbor. She earned about $100 a month doing both jobs. That's not always enough to buy food. One time, we shared two cups of rice porridge. Grandma gave me half of her portion. She said she felt full, but I knew she had not eaten anything that day. I wanted her to eat more. I thought, why is life so hard for us? Two years ago, I started to attend an after-school program supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. There, he enjoyed healthy meals, received help with school, and watched episodes of CBN's Superbook. I used to think that the world was created by Buddha and that the great Naga, a big snake, helps us live. But Superbook showed me that God created the world. He owns everything and gave us breath. At the end of the Superbook episode, I prayed to become a Christian. I believe in God and I trust Him. Then the COVID pandemic hit. I could not go to church and Grandma Don could not clean houses. Soon they ran out of food. That night, my grandson and I were so hungry. We drank two glasses of water. We cried together and I asked him, what are we going to do? I said, Grandma, I will pray. I prayed, Father God, please bless us and give us food to eat. The very next morning, Orphan's Promise came knocking on their door. We brought them a food pack with rice, eggs, fish, noodles, milk, and household cleaning supplies. I was so glad that Orphan's Promise brought us food. My grandma and I were not going to starve. God answered I's prayers, so I said, I, I will believe in your God. More recently, to help grandma earn extra money, Orphan's Promise gave her 30 hens to start a poultry and egg business. Thank you for our chicken farm. No more starving for us. And thank you for Superbook. It led us to God. I'm so happy that Grandma will be in heaven with me and Jesus. When I grow up, I want to teach the Bible to many children because Superbook changed my life. Thank you. The power to change lives. You know, we have that opportunity, folks. And I just want to invite you to be a part of that. 65 cents a day, $20 a month. Some of you are already 700 Club members. You could go up to 700 Club Gold. That's a gift of $40 a month. But look at the other options. There's a 1,000 Club level that is at $84 a month. Or you could join the 2,500 Club at $209 a month or become a founder. Those are folks who give gifts of $417 or more a month. So decide what you'd like to do and then call. And when you say you want to join the 700 Club, would you also add, I'd like to do it using Pledge Express? 
process. It means your bank does all the work. You don't have to remember anything, but it saves us some administrative costs so that we really can put even more of your gift into changing lives when people are at a point of need. We want to send you Power for Life teachings. You'll get one of these every single month. It's our way of saying thank you for using Pledge Express. And I say thank you on behalf of folks like I and Grandma Dawn for making a difference, for stepping up, going to the phone and saying, I can change your life. Here's a word from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's a great word for Mother's Day. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. When you think of your mother, think of that love. We leave you with this Mother's Day weekend with a music video written for Helen Smallbone. Helen was on the 700 Club last month, and you can watch her interview on CBN.com. Her sons, Luke and Joel, wrote the song for her and first performed it last Mother's Day. Here is For King and Country with Unsung Hero. Father, even when I'm scared, and when someone's in trouble, I'll never leave them there, and I love like my mother.